because the, the cost of walking in the door and teaching them what we talked about the last hour. Show up. Stay here. Serve the customer. Work with the rest of the team. The cost would drop dramatically, and so you could begin to afford to bring them on board. But notice how counterintuitive it is to say, in terms of the welfare state, let's cut taxes on the very entrepreneurs who are the people that the welfare state most wants to tax. And yet, if you want to create jobs, what you say to people is, go create jobs. If you're a big winner, if you employ 3,000 people, we'll make you a big winner. And suddenly you have an explosion of human energy trying to find a way to have more people at work. Similarly, you want to reward investments in productivity. I mean, how do you compete in the world market? You have the most productive workforce. I recently did a TV show with one of the wealthiest men in Mexico. And I said, you know, he said he wanted to go into the beeper business. You know, where you want to, somebody, did anybody here have a beeper? Okay, you got one here, paid over there, okay. I said, so, you know, are you going to manufacture them? He said, no. He said, we can't afford to. That the, the, the beepers are now made so efficiently in the U.S., which is what the Japanese also discovered. It's why Motorola dominates the Japanese market. That we're going to buy American beepers. Pagers. Now, if you reward investments in productivity and you dominate production, if you make it cheap to be productive, you have a whole different attitude, which means you want very low taxes on investment, you want very low taxes on new machinery, you want very low taxes on, on, on new computers and new software, so you can have the finest inventory control in the world. It's a totally different attitude than, well, they're, you know, they're making money, let's raise their taxes. That's a source of money. Be sure it's a source of money. What it does is you then slow down the very investments that make you productive, that allow you to hire people, that, that create the jobs. Uh, you want to encourage entrepreneurs in job creation by giving self-employed and small business the same tax breaks as big business. We currently do uh, two or three examples that are just... I mean, you have to wonder how out of touch with reality we could be. Big business, you buy health insurance. You get 100% deductibility. Until last week, you bought, you bought insurance as a small business, you got no deductibility. We passed 25% deductibility. It ought to be 100 Big business uh, has all sorts of tax breaks that little businesses can never get to be large enough to take advantage of. The home office deduction. If you're going into a third wave information age, you should be encouraging the home office deduction. Instead, we're piling so much red tape on it, we discourage it. I was told by something the other day that it almost guarantees you'll be audited if you list a home office. That's the opposite of sound behavior. So you want to think about how do you reward the kind of investments and how do you reward them for the self-employed, for the person who's out there on their own? We probably ought to design a system where the self-employed have an IRA that is their version of unemployment compensation. In other words, you want to literally make it easy to build your own safety net, which is the opposite of welfare state policies, which is to raise your taxes so the bureaucracy has the money, so the bureaucracy decides whether or not you're safe. Now, you want to encourage entrepreneurial learning. That's why I strongly favor for summer teenage employment that they work at real jobs and real businesses. I mean, if my choice is to give the money to the city recreation program to have them come and play basketball, or to give the same money in vouchers to small businesses to hire them to do real work, I want them as teenagers learning to do real work. I want them in real businesses dealing with real customers, working for a real boss, learning how to keep, you know, and, and it's because it's not a question just to me. And again, I'm not undervaluing. I mean, my son-in-law is a coach, and I believe deeply in, in, the, in the value of sports, and I learned a great number of things playing high school football that helped me get through my whole career. There are lots of things you can learn playing sports. I'm for playing sports. But I'm even more for making summer employment real. And that doesn't mean just, you know, painting down at City Hall because your cousin, the city councilman, got you a cushy job. I'm talking about getting people out there in the real world dealing with real customers and learning something that's very, very different. It also means, I think, reestablishing apprenticeships in a big way. We have taken far too much of learning out of the marketplace and put it into academic environments. There are a tremendous number of things you learn best by being an apprentice because they're too complicated. They're too much a matter of judgment to learn them in a classroom. The classroom breaks things down and makes it artificial, makes it too easy, for one thing. It makes it too slow. And people like Michelangelo were apprentices. I mean, he became a great sculptor and great artist because he was apprenticed to one of the great artists of his, of his time. Benjamin Franklin was an apprentice. And there's a great virtue, I think, 
to rebonding entrepreneurs to the young by having apprenticeships that, that may start as early as 16 or 17. If you have somebody who isn't good in an academic setting and they don't like sitting around and they don't want to take notes and they won't do their homework, maybe part of the answer is to figure out an apprenticeship where they go out and they do real work and earn real money and then at 25 they decide to go to night school or they go to weekend school. But you want to get them into doing things in a structured environment with a master craftsman or a master and the master craftsman may just run the dry cleaner. But learning to run a dry cleaner to earn a living is a heck of a lot better than being a dropout sitting on the street corner. So it's a totally different way of seeing things. Uh, another thing we ought to do, absolutely, is change unemployment compensation to retraining. We should not give money to people so they can bass, fish, and deer hunt. I mean, if you don't have a job and you need unemployment compensation, fine. What are you going to learn during the week that we're paying you? And if you're not willing to learn something, why are we paying you? I think it's very important conceptually that you've got to have this attitude of saying to people, we're going to have a partnership, but you have to be involved in it. You have to have a responsibility for it. If you look at it from that standpoint, let's, say, let's look at workman's comp. We ought to turn workman's compensation into assessment, retraining, and investment. Today, off to all too often, workman's comp is the lawyer's gravy train to file the suit to get money for the person who then expects to do nothing. You can't have a healthy society where, where, you are, where you're encouraging litigation and where more money goes to the administrative process than goes to rehabilitation. What you want to say to some, and by the way, very often the lawyer will say, don't go and get rehabilitated till after we're done with the trial. Now I want you to think about how dumb this is. I mean, how dumb is it to say, I can, if I can draw down here without confusing you for a second. Here is an accident, right here. What we should do is, the next day, we should assess and begin rehabilitation. Instead, in the welfare state model, first you have to go to trial. So we have, del we have delayed fixing your problem so that your problem may well get substantially worse or you may harden into it. You've lost all this intermediate income because, after all, you have to prove that, you have to be, that, that you've had this problem. So even though we live in a computer age where we probably can retrain you and you probably can be back productively at work in a relatively short time and you probably could get modest compensation, but the primary purpose of workman's comp was not to get you compensation, it was to get you an ability to get retrained and rehabilitated. So this is exactly the opposite of common sense. I mean, I mean, I mean take... And at the same time, as the employer, I'm being taxed and beaten to death for my insurance company to turn back around and just settle out of court. Right. My rates go up and nothing has happened. We're still right. waiting to go to trial. What you should have is immediate rehabilitation. Now, rehabilitation means you pay the doctor, you pay the therapist, you might buy a computer or you might, you might buy whatever equipment they need. Those dollars today go to the bureaucrat and the lawyer. First. Not in that order, yeah. Not in that order, right. <laughs> well, the bureaucrat actually is there all the time, so they get their money. Let's go back one, though. Isn't unemployment, isn't that monies that have already been paid by the employee? And if right. that is the case, isn't it inherently wrong to make them work twice for the money that they've already earned once? No. Because we compel you to pay a tax collectively. It's not money you personally. We compel people to pay a tax collectively into an, uninsur into an insurance fund for unemployment. And my point to you is, if the goal of that fund is to help you get employment, I mean, it's not called the vacation fund. Right. <laughs> no, I understand that, but by the same token, if you've paid into unemployment all your life and you find yourself unemployed and you're going to go bass fishing for three months, collect your unemployment. You didn't pay it. You're come back you didn't pay it. And everybody around you paid it. Why should we as a society, I mean, look, if you want us to set up a bass fishing fund, I'm not against bass fishing. I mean, Dick Army is, is a close friend of mine, fishes all the time. I'm not personally into bass fishing, but I'm not against it. But, uh, but we don't have a bass fishing fund. Right. I understand we have an unemployment company. Let me, let me tell you how I got to this. At Villarica High School, about eight, nine years ago, I, I, went, I went to a graduation. A man walked up to me after graduation, and he said, my daughter graduated tonight. I'm glad you're here. He said, I worked at the General Motors plant at Lakewood. They laid me off 
four years ago. And they paid me supplemental pay, which was 95%, for four years. And I thought that the plant would reopen. And now it's not going to reopen. And my supplemental pay runs out in two months. What should I do? Well, the signal we had sent to him was wait. Wait. 